What a unit has been slaughtered. Couch Talk. Hello and uh, welcome to Couch Talk. Today's guest is uh, umpire Simon Tofel. We'll talk about his decision to call time on his international umpiring career, his new role at the ICC as the umpire performance and training manager, the kind of preparation and homework he did to be one of the best and the most respected umpires in the business. We'll also discuss the issues of spread of cricket in women in the role of cricket umpires, amongst other things. Welcome to the show, Simon. Thanks, Sebas. Uh, great to be with you. Uh, it's my pleasure having you. You debuted as uh, an umpire in first-class cricket as a 24-year-old in 1995 and made the international debut in 1999 and have now retired as a 41-year-old. <laughs> prefer not to use that term, retired. I don't think many people retire at the age of 41, but uh, it seems like a long time ago since I debuted, yes. It's still quite young for an umpire, you know. The person that's about to replace you, Bruce Oxenford, in the panel, he's 51. Why did you move away from this line of work? If, uh... Yeah, sure. That's a fair question. Uh, look, for me, age is really not uh, not the issue here. Uh, I've been umpiring now for, for 22 years and for uh, at the international level, I suppose, for around about 14 years. And, um, you know, uh, re- regardless of how old I am, it's, it's not about the age. It's about... Uh, it's about my, my passion and love for the sport and it's about um, what I want to do in other areas of my life. And, you know, every year we sit down as a family and, and even just individually I look at where I want to go, what I want to do and what the goals are for the year ahead. And it just got to the stage where, you know, my passion for helping umpiring and, and helping the game of cricket was probably best served off the field with the work that I'm about to embark on, uh, along with the fact that, um, you know, I've got uh, three children whose, whose ages are 13, 11 and, and 5, and if I don't make this type of move now, then um, there's a good chance I'm going to miss uh, the rest of their childhood. So, you know, there are a number of factors at play, but age certainly had nothing to do with it, and I've had a good run, and I've enjoyed my time uh, actively on field at the international level, and I just feel as though the time's right to to um you know to pursue a different passion in in a slightly um um you know uh, different way from what i'm used to um as well as you know look at the the personal side of what i do we constantly hear about player fatigue and breakdown from injuries because of over cricket but we you know as umpires you guys are jet setting all over the world uh with very little downtime uh, how did you keep up with that uh, constant travel and demanding job. This is a question from uh, one of the listeners, Ashish. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. Um, I, I, don't, I think fatigue is probably uh, a term that's a little bit strong. Uh, unlike the players, we don't really get um, we don't get a home season, and we don't really have an off season. And what tends to happen uh, for umpires in the Australasian region, like New Zealand and Australia, for example, is that. Um, you know, during our, our international domestic season, we tend to travel overseas uh, and do most of our work uh, over there. And if, if we're not travelling overseas, then we're obligated to participate in our domestic series. So we, we sort of do go all year round. And, and while contractually we have a period of four weeks where we can request not to be appointed, um, you know, the way the Futures Tours programs work out sometimes, we don't really get um, that luxury of being able to nominate too far in advance of, mm. of a window just to try and have a break from it all. So, yes, um, uh, the job is very demanding, and, and yes, it, it's all year round. But um, uh, the way that I approached it personally was that if I wasn't, um, you know, involved in a series, I was either preparing for one and or, or training, um, or using my, my off time as productively as possible with family and friends and still thinking about cricket. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure you ever really have any downtime as such, but um, the workload's not tremendously great, but you just don't seem to have that, that ideal balance of, um, of work and rest. You mentioned preparing and training. Mm. Could you elaborate on that? Sure, yeah. Well, I suppose I worked in a four-week cycle, uh, is the best way I could describe it, much in the way that um, an athlete would, uh, someone who was training for um, uh, you know, an upcoming athletics meeting where I'd sort of build towards a, um, uh, a tour or a series where I'd you know, review laws um, in, a, in a working week. I'd probably do around six laws a day in terms of just keeping up to date with my, 
my retention of what the law was all about and uh, and interpretations. I'd also do uh, a physical fitness routine that, um, you know, would build for three weeks and then I'd have an offload week. Um, I'd do a a number of, um, every second day I would do an eye vision uh, coaching session and and those sorts of things. So, you know, I I think preparation and training is all about um, giving you the feeling that you're ready for the examination or you're ready for the the challenge that's ahead and and building that up to create a a feeling of self-confidence and uh, and preparedness for for the challenge that you're about to embark on. So that's what my training regime was like. And, and I, I suppose just like every athlete or like every cricketer, um, you know, it's the, it's the training demands sometimes that are just as rigorous and, um, and taxing as, as much as the, the activity itself of performing. Is this training regimen common across all the umpires, especially in the uh, international panel, or is it unique to yourself? You know, this is how you wanted to prepare for it. Oh, look, I think everybody prepares or trains in their own unique way and, and um, it's very much an individualist thing, but I, I'd be reasonably confident in saying that I think I probably took it to a level where the majority um, would not be, and that's no disrespect to my colleagues or, 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 no, um, or no way of trying to separate me from them. It's just that, as I said, everyone's different and everyone has a, a different workload and, um, you know, that's the way that I like to prepare and that's like the way that I tried to increase my self-belief and self-confidence that I was ready for the challenge. If, if uh, you follow cricket on a regular basis, it's, it becomes quite obvious that uh, there is an upper echelon of umpires who are really, really good. They get a lot of the things correct. And then, you know, and then it separates out. For example, you won the uh, Best Umpire Award from its inception for five years. And then Alimdar won it for uh, three years then, and now uh, Dharmasena has been awarded. Did you ever see that? You know, it's, it's like uh, you, know, you didn't win the Oscar award in a year, so perhaps you didn't win the best performance. So do you see it that way at all? You know that you won it five years in a row, but then somebody else beat you out to the uh, top post. Uh, look, I think I, the first year that uh, I was given that uh, that honour back in two thousand and four, it certainly came as as a as a surprise and as a shock. And and I can tell you from the moment I started umpiring cricket, um, no way in the world did I ever thought that I'd get this far. And I never uh, did what I did for any sorts of awards or um, or accolades in that regard. So. You know, 2004, I had people around me like uh, Daryl Hare, Steve Buckner, Dave Shepard, Rudy Kutzen, and the list goes on. And, and guys that were, were a lot more experienced than I were, uh, well, that I was at that time. And um, to, to win it in such company was just a, an absolute shock and um, you know, almost one of disbelief because I was certainly the new kid on the block. And, and you know, as I progressed every year and in the times that I got up on that podium and accepted that award, award on behalf of my colleagues because we must remember umpiring is a team sport. It's not just an individual thing that we go out there and we perform as a team and we act like a team and, and I think, quite frankly, we get judged as a team. Um, I, I've always said that, you know, those awards don't motivate me and they certainly don't drive me and it's not what umpiring is about. But... What they do provide is an opportunity to show the, uh, the coaches, the people back home, the friends and family, the people who sacrifice to help you do the things you want to do. Uh, it's great recognition for them and, you know, it's been a, a, great, um, a great journey and a great thrill to be able to, to celebrate those sorts of um, awards with them. But quite frankly, you know, uh, whether you win that award or don't win the award, um, it's not what you do, and it's about the pride in, in the way that you do things, and it's about the legacy and the reputation that you leave behind. And now you have taken over the role with ICC as umpire performance and training manager. Mm. Uh, I guess you're, you'll be operating from Sydney. What does this job entail, and uh, what is it that you wish to accomplish? Yeah, um, that's a fair question. We've sort of been working towards this role now for a couple of years where I've been doing a a part-time elite panel umpiring role and a a part-time education and training and... um, and uh, a facilitating role with with the match officials, so it's it's nothing new. It's not something that I'm entirely strange to, and I don't think my colleagues and and the referees and all the international umpires will be strange to it either. But um, what what it's all about it, it's it's a 
uh, primarily a support function for the for the elite panel and for the international umpiring group. Where uh, short term, I'm uh, going to be working with uh, Dennis Burns from Cricket Australia to develop uh, umpire accreditation programs for the ICC, which is a benchmarking and competency based program to ensure that match officials are better prepared for the challenges of international cricket. And second of all is to provide an ongoing support to those umpires in the form of workshops, seminars, uh, creating training resources to be able to help them to, you know, to perform at their optimum level and help them be, to be the best umpires that they can be. So we're really only developing um, uh, those programs with the uh, extra resource of one person, but obviously with a, a huge amount of accountability and a huge amount of passion and dedication to that role. So in the same way that I've uh, personally tried to take uh, international umpiring to a, a different level from when I started and to, to try and raise the bar, as it were, uh, from on-field performances and preparation... I'm going to try to do the same in an off-field capacity uh, using the talents and resources of the elite panel. And I must say what's really pleasing about the elite panel going forward is we look at the quality of people who join um, every year, every second year. I mean, you mentioned Bruce Oxenford, mm -hmm. and you know, so he's a very talented umpire who's just joined us. If I look at last year, you know, we've got talented people um, who, who joined us. You know, Kumar Dharmasena, Richard Kettlebra. Uh, Maria Rasmus uh, are all joining at a very high level and what's really pleasing is that the standard of those people who join us uh, year in year out is is increasing all the time which um, which says that we're doing the right things and uh, we're improving the standard and uh, you know I think we're we're heading in the right direction in your career you know when that uh, horrible terrible incident happened in Lahore in 2009 was there a time that you thought, you know, you're going to quit this business and it's not worth it? <laughs> I think the only time I, I thought about quitting the business and was it worth it was um, was probably after, after a terrible game or after a... Um, <laughs> a decision that you're not too proud of. So you just you wonder whether all, it's all worth it. But um, um, in terms of that uh, Lahore incident back in 2009, it, it, was, a, it was a matter of uh, personal safety and security, and it was one of those life decisions where you, you question whether or not um, cricket is everything it's cracked up to be. And, and it's just a terrible thing that uh, so many people lost their lives just going to a game of cricket. And, you know, it's, it wasn't something that we were, we, we were making a political statement. It wasn't something that we were endangering the lives of other people. Okay. You know, all we were doing was just going to a game of cricket and, um, you know, playing a test match. It, it, and, you know, to lose our driver uh, that day and to have people, you know, severely injured in our vehicle and to have those security uh, forces around us with so many policemen lose, lose their lives and so many families affected as a result, it does make you, just, I think, question the, the value of life and what life's all about. So it was more of a personal reflection than it was a, a professional cricket one, if I can, if I can put it that way. There was a recently a uh, TV channel sting operation where six umpires, uh, not elite umpires, of course, uh, six umpires were caught in it, uh, allegedly uh, being ready to fix matches. And uh, if you had followed in the NBA a few years ago, there was the case of uh, the referee Donaghy, and who was making calls during games for gambling line purposes. What are your thoughts on this, and what does cricket do in this respect, with respect to you know umpires? Umpires are vulnerable off the field as well, you know, as much as players. Well, obviously, I can't comment on on the ongoing investigation and on those issues that are involved. But, but what I would say was that you know umpires have a responsibility to to show a high level of integrity and to and to be leaders in that area um, and to make sure that at all times they uh, they work within the the ICC's policies of uh, anti corruption and um, and behavioural ethics. So, you know, th those policies are quite clear, and um, you know. We are very focused on making sure that, that as individuals, you know, we follow those. But, um, you know, it's a well-documented process. And, and if anybody's concerned about an approach that's been made by an individual, then um, they understand what the, uh, 
what the protocols are of who to contact and, and what to um, what to advise those authorities. But you know, as for what's happening at the moment, that process will run its course, and and um, you know those investigations will take place. From my perspective, you know, the, the work that I do with our umpires, it's all about integrity, being a good person, and if you do those things, then being a good umpire naturally follows. What does it take to be a good umpire? I mean, you've been one of the best. Well, you've been the best for a while in almost your entire international career. What does it take to be a really good umpire? Well, I think it takes a lot of things, but um, but just briefly, uh, first of all, hard work um, and a dedication and a commitment to looking for ways to continually get better. I think it means having an appreciation and an empathy for what the players are going through and, and to make sure that that, um, that you match the professionalism that they put into their game with your own level of professionalism and, and, um, and leadership and to be able to... Um, uh, make decisions, and I'm not just talking outs and not outs, but to make decisions in line with the expectations of, uh, of the players and, and support staff that, you know, we're one big cricketing family and it's important that we, um, you know, we're fair income in our approach to, to umpiring and, and the seriousness and professionalism of the job. Uh, obviously, communication and people skills, you know, I think uh, far too much uh, the media focuses on maybe a, a court behind or an LBW that um, is debatable. But far too frequently we forget the real skill of what good umpiring is all about, which is being able to manage the match uh, in, a, in a fun and, and fair environment, to be able to make uh, you know, good value judgments to play as, as often as, and as long as we can, to be able to have good relationships with, uh, with that cricketing family and to, and to make um, um, you know, good value judgments about the way that we play the game with everybody's uh, safety and, and uh, enjoyment in mind. Um, th- those are the things, I think, that, that make a good umpire, apart from you know, just always looking for ways to improve your game and to deliver the highest possible standard. And you know, the way I was brought up in New South Wales was not to be the centre of attention, was to keep the focus and and um, um, you know, meter attention on the players because that's what the people um, pay their money to see. Mm-hmm. And you know, if the umpire's done a good job, he's gone unnoticed. And if if I can go unnoticed in in my games, that was certainly the um, that was certainly the ambition. And to walk off that field knowing that you've you've given um, you know a really good effort and account of yourself, and you know you can be proud of what you've done and. And uh, I feel as though that you haven't been um, mentioned in the broadcast or, or on the back <laughs> of the newspaper. As of these days, you have the giant replay screens um, w- within the ground. And, you know, you, let's say you've made a decision and uh, the player is walking off, but, you know, he's rubbernecking and turning around, watching the replay constantly. Maybe it was a close decision f- from the batsman perspective. What goes on in your mind at the time? And, Somebody's looking behind at the re- replay. Perhaps you got something wrong. What goes on? In let me head? tell you. Let me tell you. You get something wrong, and there's a lot of people that are prepared to be uh, experts and, and provide <laughs> you with feedback. You know, there's there's no shortage of people in the ground, either on the field of play, or as you walk back to the dressing room, or even as you as you get in your car on the way home, or or even um, you know when you go to breakfast the following morning. There's plenty of people who'd like to be able to point um, point your failings out to you. Uh, it's a very public. Uh, job that we do and as I was sort of uh, in, intimating before if you get everything right you know you go unnoticed and nobody says anything you get something slightly wrong and everybody's an expert and is prepared to show the benefit of of the amount of replays that people get to be able to point something out to you so um, yeah, yeah look you, you just have to deal with that in a very uh, rational way and not try to get too emotional about it so Mental toughness uh, as an umpire is incredibly important. And the way that uh, I suppose the best way I can, ad- I can advise people as to how to deal with it is to, is to be very rational about it. And so you've seen it once. Uh, you saw it the best way you could at mm-hmm. providing you with the right mental frame of mind at the time. And that means that, you know, you were in that here and now space that we often talk about. Then you've seen it once. You've made the best decision you could. And if it just so happens that you haven't been able to spot what one of the 29 other cameras have seen, <laughs> or, you, or if you haven't been able to be as good as the predictive path of uh, one of the ball tracking systems, or, or if you haven't been as good as the heat-seeking technology of Hotspot, 
um, you've just got to cop it on the chin and move on and say, well, you know, uh, maybe I wasn't as good on that occasion as I thought I was. Learn something from it and come back stronger for the next ball. Now, that just takes a, a huge amount of mental toughness and fortitude to to try and park that sort of incident and come back stronger. But, you know, look, as you said before, I've been around for a while and my career's sort of spanned a large number of years. So funny about that, we keep coming back for more, don't we? <laughs> You know, you briefly mentioned about the technologies being used. In a philosophical sense, um, there's a question that comes from a listener, Suhas. And how do you view the uh, DRS? You know, do you see it primarily as an impairing aid or a hindrance? Or how do you see it? And do you have any suggestions on how it might be better utilized? Well, I think it's just, uh, without going into that too far, I mm-hmm. think it's just really important to understand and, and note that uh, with the amount of scrutiny that umpires are under these days, with the amount of replays, the amount of cameras, the different forms of technology that are used to scrutinise decisions, that uh, our elite panel average is just under 95% um, for the last 12 months as, a, as an overall average of decision-making for correct decisions Mm -hmm. and you know i I think we need to look at the plus side of the scrutiny and and um and realize that technology does show that the majority of the decisions that we do make are in fact correct so you know i think that's um that's a credit to the elite panel and it's a credit to the international standard that we um uh, that we promote these days but in my new role i'm looking for ways to help the umpires get even better before we even have to use technology in the first place Mm -hmm. And another question comes from uh, listener Kartikeya. How does working as a TV umpire affect your performance on the field while you're standing at the bowler's end, you know, which is supposed to be the best position to judge? So how does <laughs> having, you know, from time to time you are in the third umpire booth looking at the replays and making calls on the reviews, etc. So how does it help you? Um, I'd probably like to make two points in relationship to that question. Uh, the first one would be that, I think these days being third umpire in in a full technology series, I think arguably the better umpires almost need to be in the third umpire's box because that's where you can't afford to make a mistake. And it's an incredibly challenging uh, umpiring role these days because not only do you have to be very familiar with the technology and how to use it, but you also have to be able to interpret it, uh, apply it, uh, while also support your on-field colleagues uh, with over-rates and and other forms of decisions and manage the match uh, as well from an off-field position. Um, And the other point that I'd like to make in relationship to uh, getting an appreciation for umpiring is is that when we are in in an ICC series like we were recently with the T20 Mm -hmm. um, world event uh, in Sri Lanka, was that we all rotate between on-field third umpire and even fourth umpire positions. And I think what that role does uh, for an international umpire is it gives them an appreciation for what it's like to do all the different roles, particularly the fourth umpire role, as you get very close to seeing the players um, as they walk off the field um, that might have been dismissed uh, or walk on the field or how they might prepare or going into their rooms to, you know, have one of the the balls selected for the innings and you get an appreciation for how much effort and um, professionalism they put into their job. And it really just makes you um, sort of get back to, to grassroots cricket rather than just think that, you know, you just go out there and, and do your job the way that you've always done it. You get to see cricket from a different perspective and you get to appreciate sometimes what the players are going through, what the spectators go through, and, and what the man in the street is also saying as well. So you know, all those things are good reality checks to appreciate um, the other roles that you you just sort of you can fall into the habit of taking for granted. So, um, you know, the third umpire role now is becoming incredibly challenging. There's a lot to manage. There's overrates, there's ball counting, there's overs per bowler, you know, there's code of conduct, there's front foot no balls, there's um, uh, run out stumpings, hit wickets, there's boundary decisions, there's DRS player challenges. There's a whole lot. So, you know, it's an incredibly challenging role. And on top of that, you actually have to be a master of communication, mm-hmm. key uh, working with different directors, knowing where the different camera angles and replays are, and being able to get the best footage possible to make the best decision possible rather than just, you know, take what you get. So it's, it's a real challenging role these days, no question asked. 
I have two follow-up questions on the things that you mentioned. First, one of the more used and abused uh, phrase these days is the spirit of cricket. You know, it has become a convenient tool for one party when it suits them to preach morality to another. You know, for example, when it comes to mankating, batsman or the ba- captain of the batting team, you, you know, would say, oh, it's the right thing to do not to mankate, even though it is within the laws of the game as a proper mode of dismissal. You know, well, so why do umpires sometimes go and put the burden on the dilemma and the dilemma on the fielding captain? Well, um, umpiring technique is not to be confused with the spirit of cricket. And what traditionally we have done with that particular issue of running up the non-striker at the bowler's end is before the umpire makes a decision and make and puts himself in a difficult position where he's he's often asked to withdraw that appeal and to let the batsman stand should he make that call is, as a matter of courtesy and umpiring technique, is to check with the fielding captain if he wishes that appeal to proceed. Mm. Um, It's a good check and balance for that captain to have that opportunity before the umpire does make a decision. And and basically, the umpire is asking the fielding captain, is this the way you want to play the game of cricket? If the answer is yes, he makes his decision. If the answer is no, we go back and we bowl another delivery. So it's more of an umpiring technique than it is um, a spirit of cricket issue. And on the spirit of cricket issue, all that simply is about is about one word, which is called respect. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when when we talk about uh, how we want to play the game, it's all about respect. It's about respect for the opponents. It's respect for each other. It's respect for the umpire's decision. And it's respect for the game. And, you know, we, we all play the game slightly differently, but one of the key phrases I love about uh, this so-called... Um, um, spirit of cricket is is that key phrase that's not cricket or it's not cricket mm-hmm. you know w- what I love about cricket is its unique traditional values about about respect and it's about almost being um, self governance um, and be- players being able to play the game without intervention of an umpire about what's acceptable practice and what's not acceptable practice. And I think the only thing that we have to bear in mind these days is it's become an incredibly professional and uh, career-minded game where sometimes it's not a game, it's actually a profession. And you've got people who are competing for high stakes and you've got players who are playing for their contracts and playing for their careers. Mm -hmm. And does test uh, the resolve and those values and some of those uh, traditions, if you like. Um, so in the heat of battle, you know, uh, I can understand that the pressures that the players do go through where some of those traditions and values are slightly blurred. And that's where I think that, you know, the, the role of the umpire is to come in and hopefully add a bit of a calming influence and as a form of check and balance, you know, see exactly how the, the fielding captain does want to play the game of cricket. Wouldn't the uh, DRS then essentially violate what you've just mentioned in terms of respect and, you know, the spirit of cricket? Uh, You could draw that conclusion, yes. (laughs) 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 So that's where you end it? There's no further... Uh, Well, it's it's really not for me to comment on, but but that's one way of looking at it. But other people might have a different view. But I think these days going forward, given the professionalism and the career-minded approach that I just mentioned about how the players uh, play the game, I think it's incumbent on umpires and incumbent on the game to try and get as many correct decisions as possible. Fair enough. So so it is a balance. It is a balance. You mentioned about communication. I'm assuming it's the communication with the players, the team management, and within the umpiring fraternity, etc. Um, but what about the end consumer, the fan? Um, because sometimes we hear about, uh, hear from the commentary box, oh, the uh, on-field umpires and uh, the third umpire, this is what they're talking about. We never mm-hmm. get an explanation for why a certain decision was made. Whereas, you know, in pretty much any professional sport around the world, you know, for example, if a major league baseball umpire blows a call, um, usually there is a press conference at the end of the game where the umpire explains, well, this is what I saw, this is how I made the decision, let's move on. Sure. Well, I don't see too many uh, umpires or former umpires these days get invited to to be part of a commentary team, first and foremost. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you know of any? In... Um, in, uh, (laughs) in, uh, other professional sports, you mean? 
Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the other sports have uh, have dabbled in that. Particularly, um, uh, Australian football actually had a, a former umpire as one of their commentary team for mm-hmm. for a few years here at one point in time, and I think it adds a different dimension uh, because. You know, it adds an extra balance to to what the the former players are talking about, and you know the, the laws and playing conditions and their interpretations do change on almost an annual basis, and it is very challenging these days to keep pace with that. And I think we have a duty to try and educate uh, the spectators as well as the players on on what those changes are, and more particularly how match officials are going to view those issues from time to time. And, you know, when you've got uh, players who are, or former players who are commentating, uh, it's very easy for them to <laughs> to, um, to skew their, their comments based on whether they were a former batsman or a former bowler or <laughs> whether they were a former player for one particular participating team. So, you know, I, I'd like to see uh, going forward, um, a little bit of uh, demystifying of, of what we do and the way that we do it. However, um, that aside, I, I certainly take on board what you were saying about um, you know match officials not commenting or not explaining certain things. And I think going forward there is scope to do that. But uh, we, we need to be very cautious about how we manage that because I have seen many examples in the past where a very good umpiring decision has been ruined by a very poor explanation. Hmm. And that's not to say that we shouldn't um, start to go there more, but, um, you know, sometimes um, we, we do things that, that aren't easily explained or at least when they're attempted to be explained, the right message does not come across. So you were right in what you're saying before, that communication is vital. Mm-hmm. I think access uh, certainly has a, a, a place within match officiating to try and do that. But you also have to appreciate too that we have a, a large cross-section of people that do umpire international cricket, a lot of whom English is not their first language. Mm-hmm. and able to uh, get their message or get their point of view across easily and um, and concisely without confusing uh, people, um, you know, and once you do open yourself up to media scrutiny in that way, you know, it's a bit like this interview. I mean, you will ask things that weren't on the table or that mm-hmm. weren't supposed to be covered and in, in you'll, try to, you'll try to add more viewer interest or, or more more uh, or grab a headline um, or take a particular comment out of context. So we do have to be very careful about what we say because, you know, integrity, impartiality, um, a sense of non-bias is important to maintain. And, and, uh, and not only are we representing ourselves when we speak publicly, but we're also representing the game of cricket. We're representing ICC and, and even our home board. So, you know, we, we have to be very mindful of um, promoting the game in a positive way. And, um, yeah, so, so we have to be quite guarded at times, yeah. Uh, when it comes to the relationships that you may have with the players of specific country or city or whatever, question comes from a listener, Hassan. How do you make sure any existing relationship you may have does not subconsciously affect your decision making yeah that is a good question and um you know you mentioned uh, my age when i started umpiring and and mm-hmm. particularly my first class in international career and i, I certainly undertook playing um uh, with a passion like i undertook umpiring with a passion when i started my um, representative career i was umpiring uh, guys that i played representative cricket with and so i was in the same uh, age group as, as people like adam adam gilchrist and michael slater and and a few other people that um that your listeners would would relate to mm-hmm. and I, and for me it was about having a professional arm's length with those players and ensuring that I wasn't seen to be or, or wasn't considered to be uh, their mates or their friends, but, you know, that I, I still was able to, you know, have a conversation with these these players. And even today I still can, and, and I'm, you know, uh, very just as easily able to have a, a good conversation off-field with Verinda Saywag in a, in a semi-final of a, um, of a Champions League match mm-hmm. um, and then be able to give him out LBW the next time I see him. I'm very able and, and, and um, capable of doing that, providing it's the right decision and it's the right thing that should be done. And, you know, when you conduct yourself in a way that you earn the player's respect, uh, those decisions are very easy. 
when you have inappropriate relationships with players or support staff that compromise the ability for you to make the right decision at the right time, that's when you do lose respect. And and I'd like to think that uh, having left recently the international scene, I can leave with the respect of those participants and the respect of um, the, you know, the cricketing family for having the courage and ability to, to maintain professional relationships with people, but also have the courage to make the right decision at the right time, regardless of who's involved, um, and, and, yeah, and walk away from those situations holding my head up high. You know, in the elite panel, you have a collection of umpires from all over the world, and most, most of the countries represented. And, you know, in cricket's past, we have had issues of neutrality. A home umpire may have... Uh, adjudicated in favor of the home team, so on and so forth. Uh, but another question comes from uh, listener Shoeb, and can his question is: Can neutrality be achieved in the sense that you could have local umpires? You know, for example, if Pakistan is playing in a match in Pakistan or UAE, for that matter, you know, you could have Alim Dar and Asad Rauf do it, and not worry about where their interests might lie. Yeah, well, I think the first thing to recognise is that all umpires are neutral, um, first and foremost, and I, mm-hmm. I'm yet to meet an international umpire who, who thinks otherwise. And with the level of uh, performance scrutiny that's placed on, on each match official from ICC's head office in Dubai, each umpire is performing to, to meet with the approval of, of those assessments and the people who do assess our performance. So from that perspective, I'm, I'm very comfortable sitting here talking to you and, and knowing that every umpire is is unbiased and does act fairly in that respect. Mm-hmm. What I think is important, though, so far as the game is concerned, and I certainly understand this, this perspective, is that the perception of neutrality is almost just as important as the factual reality of neutrality. Mm. It's... It's it's all it's all about perception, and, and umpiring for me is all about how people perceive us to be. If people perceive that an umpire is a poor communicator or a poor decision maker, regardless of the facts, he is. And it's very important how we deal with those perceptions. And neutrality is just one of those issues. And while ever we have, have um, non-participating, um, you know, umpires from the countries involved, while ever we have that independence of appointments and people involved umpiring who aren't from the, the home country or from the visiting country, then that whole matter of whether they're giving a favourable decision based on where they come from is eliminated. So it's not even up for a debate or argument, and it's not even part of the picture. And so if an umpire does make a mistake, it's, it's not clouded by the fact that there is an underlying reason for that mistake. And that, that in itself is good for the sport, and it's good for the, uh, it's good for the debate, but, you know... There are varying levels of neutrality that we have across international cricket. You know, international T20s uh, that are uh, a bilateral series are umpired solely by by the home board umpires, and you know that seems to go through relatively smoothly. One day internationals, we do have a home board appointment. Um, so, if we have an ODI here in Australia, we will have a Cricket Australia umpire with an ICC umpire, and if it's a DRS series, an ICC umpire will be in the third umpire's box. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have varying levels of neutrality, but I think going forward what's really important is that every umpire on the park and in the third umpire's box performs their their ability and their capacity. And as I said before, each umpire uh, is assessed by ICC and their sole focus is to perform well and have a good assessment from the ICC. There is a flood of questions in terms of how is it different umpiring in a match uh, in the subcontinent and outside the subcontinent. And, for example, you know, one day you might be uh, officiating in a test match in England and the following week you could be, you know, in uh, Ahmedabad on third week or, or a month later, you might be somewhere else. How do you adjust uh, to the different local conditions? You know, some places you may have more bounce, less bounce. Yeah, it's an interesting point, and, the, and that's one of the beauties of international cricket, and we're no different to the players. We have to adjust to conditions very quickly, 
and um, very few of us get the opportunity of a trial match before before the big game starts. Mm-hmm. And with a, a jam-packed international calendar, it's not a luxury that we can often um, take advantage of. So uh, getting used to net sessions uh, and getting used to the bounce, getting used to the turn, getting used to the different foods, uh, the climate, you know, whether it's very hot or whether it's very cold in New Zealand, for example, mm-hmm. um, as much uh, preparation can be done with getting familiar to those conditions and getting used to the different time zones, particularly, you know, getting into sleeping patterns. You know, look, uh, you know, if you go to uh, South Africa from Australia, from ex- for example, it's a, it's a 13 hour journey, but you're crossing multiple time zones. Um, now, granted that the, the playing conditions might be relatively similar to Australia mm-hmm. in terms of bounce, seam and, and weather, just getting used to your different sleeping patterns and, and not being um, subject to waking up at uh, 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning and then trying to or wanting to go back to sleep at 1 o'clock in the afternoon is, is a challenge in itself. And you've got to try and assimilate into different uh, time zones as quickly as possible, getting used to different foods. And you mentioned the subcontinent. You know, one of the challenges there is is to not do things um, radically too differently from what you would do from home. So, you know, you try and pick foods and try and pick um, uh, eating habits that uh, are very similar to what you do at home. And if you can't find them, uh, then you've, you've got to try really hard to, to, to find a good substitute. So... And stick to your normal um, uh, pat- routines and patterns that you would at home in terms of what time you would normally go to bed. Um, but apart from that, you've got the cricketing issues. And, and as you mentioned before, you know, you've got different pitches in the subcontinent to what we've got here in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so for me, it's about getting extra, some, getting some extra net sessions under my belt. It's about looking at some different video clips about what to expect from different types of bowlers. Mm-hmm. It's about the mindset of the cricket that's about to be in front of you and being prepared for that particular type of delivery and what's likely to happen. You know, so you have to anticipate without prejudging and it's about changing your mindset and um, as being as prepared as possible. Uh, last couple of questions and then uh, we can wind up. Uh, there are a couple of questions from listeners. You know, has there ever been, have you ever been in a situation where because of know, the artistry that was in front of you because you have the best seat in the house mm. where you may have slightly, you know, leaned towards becoming a fan and enjoying yeah. what's being done in front of you. If that ever happened, uh, what was the situation, if you remember? Yeah, that gets back to your early question about um, about the relationships with players and about being able to make the right decision. Uh, look, unfortunately for me, the way that I've approached my cricket umpiring is that I've become a, a terrible cricket watcher. <laughs> I've almost... I've almost dissociated, disassociated myself with um, the beauty of the game and, and all I see there is a, is a set of pads and I have to watch the ball and work out where it's pitched and what it's hit and where it's going and I don't even really care who's bowling and I don't really care who's batting. I've just got to make those very um, uh, very clinical judgments and not be too worried about um, who's involved. And if, unfortunately for me, as a result, I've, I, I haven't appreciated sometimes some of the skill involved in who's actually playing. You know, whether it's a whether it's an innings by Tendulkar, whether it's a it's a magnificent spell by a Warn, or it's um or it's the guile of uh, Murley, um, or it's the um or it's the patience and, and execution of a Dravid or a or a Jax Callis, and. Um, that's probably one of the disadvantages that I've got in my style of umpiring. And I, I don't think that all every umpire does this. You'd have to ask them that question. But for me, the best way that I can make those independent, mm-hmm. valued technical judgments is not to get too involved in what a player is doing or, or appreciate the skill necessarily of what they're doing because once you get too involved in those sorts of issues, I think it can affect your... Um, not not your independence so much, but just your value judgment about what you're about to do next. And so for me, it's all about bat and ball or it's about pads and stumps or it's about pitch and where it's going. And so you know, these days when I watch cricket, I look at what the umpires are doing or I think about the tactics of the players in terms of what they're, what they're trying to achieve and trying to be in front of the game and trying to be ready for what they're going to do next. 
rather than appreciate sometimes the skill that's actually involved and the, and the talent that's on display. So every time I look at cricket matches now, it's about what are the umpires doing and how can they do that better and would I do that if I was in their position and, and make those sorts of judgments. So I'm a terrible cricket watcher these days. <laughs> a couple of listeners want to know, is there a particular uh, decision or an on-field situation that you regret the most? <laughs> There's quite a few. I, I look at, <laughs> like something that sticks in your mind. Oh, look, I think every umpire, uh, and, and I'm very comfortable and confident that if you if you asked any umpire, you know, do you remember your big mistakes, the answer is yes, because mm-hmm. they're almost like battle scars that you um, that you get and, you know, they create such, such um, interesting emotions of, of how did I do that and how did I get that wrong and, you know, what happened there? And, and you think about it for so much that you, you just don't forget some of your big mistakes and some of the things that didn't go according to plan. So you carry those with you for a long, long time. And, and the challenge is to really learn from them and to, um, and to get stronger and, and to focus on what you do right. And sometimes we just don't remember all those positive moments and those great games and those great decisions and those great moments as much as we remember the, the ones that didn't go right. So, yeah, look, um, look, I could list quite a few, but I'm not sure your listeners have got that much time. Um, <laughs> but they, they do stick with you and, um, and they drive you and they make you work harder. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, they're still with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see how you have answered without actually answering the question. Yeah, exactly. Good tool, isn't it? The listeners would be able to remember their own moment. <laughs> well, pardon me? I'm sure the listeners could remember their own moment of, of games. <laughs> so I don't think I need to remind them. Um, one last question comes from Meenal. She wonders whether there is ever a possibility of a um, female umpire in the men's game. Because recently Absolutely. we saw in the NFL in the U.S. there was first time in a real-life game there was a, one of the sideline referees was a woman. Yep. No, absolutely. Um, no problem with that whatsoever. Uh, uh, look, I, I grew up doing first grade cricket in Sydney where we had a female umpire by the name of Stephanie Harmon and she did a, a large number of first grade games and well respected and um, and certainly a great attribute um, uh, to our group at the time. And uh, we've actually got a female umpire who's going to be attending the Under-19 uh, Women's World Cup uh, being held in India early next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kathy, Kathy Cross will be attending there with um, also international uh, panel member umpires and associate affiliate umpires from all around the world. And Kathy will be performing, and she deserves to be there based on on her ability and her merit. So, you know, I, there's no problem so far as I'm concerned. And, and the more women involved in umpiring and uh, in the game of cricket, uh, I'm all for that. And, um, yeah, happy to support um, that advancement. And also had the great pleasure of what I do as well is is I try and cross-pollinate with other sports and learn what I can off what they do. Mm -hmm. And in in the game of um, NRL, the National Rugby League competition here in Australia, we also have um, uh, female touch judges and um, and assistant referees involved in that sport too. And and that can only help, uh, you know, uh, encourage further participation by women in the sport. And in, in, a, in a side of the sport where we sometimes struggle to actually have enough umpires or enough match officials, um, I've got no problem at all opening it up to as many different groups as possible mm-hmm. to get people involved and to participate. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot for coming on the show, Simon. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you. Not a problem, and, um, and thanks for the opportunity. My pleasure. Cheers. Couch Talk.